Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Florence, to my studio, and to the final part in the Saturn Devouring His Child maquette version 1 series. There will definitely be a version 2, and probably a larger version 3 as well. I'm taking the preparation phase more seriously than ever before this time around, to hopefully ensure increased success when I get around to sculpting the larger-than-life version. The reason I make maquettes is to problem solve. Without a tangible object in front of me, solving problems, sculptural problems, become very difficult. A maquette is of huge help because it's a relative small time and material commitment, something I can make in about six, four to six hours, and the realization of the initial idea can help manifest new ideas. And so I design and then iterate on my initial design which is why I will make one or two more maquettes, to further refine and adjust the design. Before I've only really made one maquette, sometimes this is enough, but it's also a sign of laziness, or rather perhaps overexcitement about beginning the actual sculpture and not setting aside enough time for the planning stage. Because this sculpture is going to be over life size, adjustments once the sculpture is begun is going to be almost impossible. So I need to solve all my issues here in maquette form and come up with a design that I am close to 100% confident in. The plan is to make another small maquette like this, and then if that maquette hits the spot, I'll make a larger one, probably around quarter scale perhaps, I don't know, to further refine the design so that when I begin the over life size version, I'll have a clearly formed plan. With most of the clay up there on the sculpture, most of the forms and volumes realized, it becomes time for modeling. Modeling as a term, the way I use it, could be replaced by rendering perhaps, but it's not really surface rendering, it's the rendering of the forms and the transitions in between them. Exactly why and where the term modeling comes from I'm not entirely sure. Traditionally, sculpture meant carving in stone, while sculpting in clay was called modeling, but no one really uses those terms anymore in that fashion. I guess in the beginning I'm adding clay, blocking the figure in, and then I model what's there and add less amounts of clay, only meant to realize and further enhance what has been blocked in. Anyways, none of that really matters. In this scale, modeling is really not that difficult. Normally at the Florence Academy of Art, we use the torso projects to practice and refine the skill of modeling forms. This begins after a year and a half of practicing blocking in, which we do in smaller scales to keep the students from spending too much time drifting into modeling forms essentially. Of course you can transfer anything from large scale to small scale, I suppose, but Modeling and the depth of knowledge associated with modeling is best explored in a larger format. So what does modeling mean here in this tiny format? Well, it essentially means taking clay and filling the gaps in between the forms that I established in the blocking in stage. Sometimes I get studio visits. Here is Sandeep visiting the studio. You might remember him from a few other videos. Now usually I listen to music on my headphones and so I never hear when people knock and people knock and then they walk away. So if you're ever in the neighborhood and want to see the studio, knock lightly and if I don't answer, see, if, check the door, peek your head in carefully in case there is a nude model in there. If no one is nude in the studio, I'll be happy to talk with you. This is oil-based clay, which I heat up before applying. So the clay on my sculpture is already cooled down a bit, and it's quite hard, quite firm. The warm new clay that I add doesn't really disturb the clay of the figure when I add it, because the clay that's added is soft, and the clay that's already there is hard. You can do very much the same thing with water-based clay. Let the figure you've blocked in dry and harden slightly before modeling, and you will be able to model and add clay then without disturbing the clay previously added. 
There is another element to modeling that happens here simultaneously to filling in the gaps in between the blocked in forms, and that is adding volume to each and every form. Usually if you don't consider this, the figure ends up looking too flat, even if you have good transitions. More often than not, more volume than you would think needs to be added. Most of the blocked in forms will probably be pretty generalized as far as volume goes as well. Many of them won't be affected by gravity in a convincing way, or all the forms will have very similar, similar looking volumes. This is one of the great benefits of working from life. You will find infinite variety in all sorts of things when observing the human body. In the beginning, however, you'll find a bunch of similarities and you'll simplify. Later, as you get better and better, you'll find the variety and once you fall down this rabbit hole, you'll realize its depth and just how much variety actually exists. Let's just say it's a deep rabbit hole and probably a topic for another video. Here, today, I'm not working from life, so the variety will be limited. And that's okay, the maquette is not about that. I'm using the knowledge that I've accumulated while working from life to come up with some semblance of variety. But it'll never be the same, there is no substitute to working from life. The last thing to mention is that I do adjust my block in as I progress through the modeling stage. Less so here than what I would normally do because of the limited time frame I'm working within, the, the small scale, and the fact that I'm simply not interested in perfecting this. It's, a maquette is not about perfecting a block in. But I still find myself adjusting or adding forms wherever I see necessary and fit. At a larger scale and with a model, this would be a huge part of the modeling stage. And I would spend a lot of time doing this. As I progress and the sculpture begins resembling the model more and more, the differences become more and more apparent. Part of the trick is to anticipate this and deal with the adjustments that need to be made before committing to a defunct solution. If you pay attention and work and practice deliberately with a mind aimed at improving yourself, you'll slowly get better at anticipating. We all have bad habits and we all make mistakes. The difference is in the ability to recognize the bad habits and the mistakes, anticipate them happening and dealing with them before they come home to roost. The tools I use for modeling at this scale is pretty much the same I would use for a larger scale, except that they're smaller. For the most part, it's a Taranti wood tool, which is linked below. It's kind of a wooden spatula in a way, I guess, and a Kemper loop tool, also linked below. They are very simple tools, but you do not need much. At the end of the day, it's not really about the tools, but about the skill you have in using the tools. Tools are just an extension of your hand. And as long as the tool doesn't get in the way, it's all about your mind and your ability to execute on what your mind sees and the decisions your mind makes. In the beginning, any tool will be difficult to wield. A little practice solves this rather quickly. But some tools are, of course, more suited to the shapes we are trying to create here. I like to have a very small tool selection or a small variety of tools, but in many different scales so that I never use a tool which I'm not proficient with. It's easier to get good with a few tools and it's better to be good with a few tools than to be decent with many tools. That being said, it hasn't stopped me from accumulating a giant collection of tools. My students and fellow instructors and I have discussions during lunch, coffee breaks and after school. Sometimes these discussions are on important topics such as who would win in a fight, a gorilla or a moose. I'm on team moose myself. And sometimes we talk about art and where what we do fit in, which is a very existential conversation. One thing that's been discussed lately is what to make art of, and art associated with stories, and particularly stories from cultures you perhaps don't belong to or haven't much connections to. 
There is certainly something to be said of art and artists who take the heritage of where they are from and turn it into art. Sculpture as a visual medium is perhaps not the best suited to tell stories. We have movies, books, songs, and all of these do perhaps a better job of communicating story. This argument has been made in our discussions and it's been made well. It's hard to argue against it, so I'm not going to try. I will, however, counter with what I believe is sculpture's strength, which is depicting a pivotal moment in a story, bringing said moment into the three-dimensional world we humans inhabit. Individual moments are not well captured by songs. Songs move along at whatever pace or rhythm the musician has chosen. If the song stops, it's not a song anymore. A book has to be read, and to read we need to progress down the page. If we stop, the story stops. We can pause film, but then it's not a film, it's just a picture. It's not a film at all anymore. Film needs at least 24 frames per second moving along to be a film. Now there's nothing wrong with a picture. It potentially serves the same purpose in depicting a moment as a sculpture could, but a picture is not of this world. Pictures are illusions, 2D magic tricks, while sculptures are real. So I believe the strength of sculpture is to depict a moment, and the impact of sculpture is heightened by the fact that sculpture occupies the very same space that we do. The moment can be pondered, considered, forever. Sculpture is not fleeting. Even the materials sculpture is made out of serves this purpose. Stone and metal. Very few materials used in art rival these as far as endurance go. And this brings me back to myself and a Scandinavian making art depicting a story from Greek mythology. I'm not Greek. Norway is actually pretty far from Greece, maybe as far as any country in Europe. I have little to no connection to Greece, so where does this sculpture fit then? Does sculpture inspired by Greek mythology still have a place at all, or is Greek mythology too far removed to be relevant? Some stories last forever, and capture us in a way that others don't. Some stories hit very hard at the time of release, they are perfect for the time they are released in. And I think Harry Potter fits in here, for example. And I'm sure Harry Potter will last for a very long time as well, but that still remains to be seen. Some stories hit home for generations. Now, Lord of the Rings fit this bill. It's not the second most sold book ever based on Tolkien's excellent writing style. It sells and has lasted because the story hits home with us. The story rings true for most of us. So what about stories that have lasted for thousands of years? Stories from Greek mythology hits at what it means to be human. This is why many mythologies from several places around the world seem to have very similar stories. Those that have lasted, lasts because they tell stories integral to the human experience. And this doesn't change much depending on your geographical location, and it hasn't changed as much throughout time as we perhaps would like to think. These stories, the characters they depict, are archetypes. Prototypes for the kind of people that exists. Real people are often more complex than archetypes, of course, but the archetype describes perhaps our experience of the people, which is often a lot more shallow than who a person actually is if he or she were to be described fully. For an archetype to be an archetype, it can never die. An archetype is forever real, forever present. The story of the Greek Titan Cronus, or the Roman version Saturn, is the story of the devouring father denying his offspring their destiny. It's the story of the people you trust the most betraying you to the detriment of you becoming all you could be. It's the parent, the teacher, the leader, 
not delivering on his duty and failing his subject. And it's an ever-present danger we have to look out for as a collective and as individuals. I'm not into making political statements or political art. I believe art that deals with the now is fleeting unless properly conceived, which is very difficult to do. It's easy to make art that deals with the politics of the now. Perhaps that sort of art finds a place by being an object depicting a certain issue pertaining to a certain period in time. But sculpture, as mentioned above, is at its best when depicting the eternal. And it's not difficult to find examples to how the story of Cronus can relate to now. On a personal level, examples of failed parents who selfishly hold their children back and betray the promise of giving their child a springboard to launch a better life than what they had, it's, it's not hard to find, sadly. If you want to look on a broader level, a more macro level, you can find examples on both sides of the political spectrum of how our leaders have failed us. An example that's talked about a lot today is the climate and how politicians are slow and reluctant to make changes. Changes that increase the potential for a better world for those they are responsible for. But changes that will likely decrease their popularity and decrease their chances of re-election. The story of Cronus, of the devouring father denying his children a chance at fulfilling their destiny, has not become any less relevant in 2000 years. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Click like and subscribe if you did. And check out some of the links in the description. There are links to materials, tools, and to my Patreon page if you are interested in supporting the continued existence of this channel. Here are the finished images of the piece. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.